Hey guys, and welcome to another episode. In today's video, we're gonna be tearing down the mini motor and we're hopefully going to be able to find the source of the problem as to why I have a misfire in cylinder four. So we have the engine removed from the mini, we have the engine on an engine stand, and we're gonna be taking this all off, everything on the front side of the motor, everything around here that isn't needed is coming off. So basically everything except for the internals of the motor are coming off in this video. So let's jump right into it and let's start off by removing the accessory belt. So if we're working on the front side of the motor, we've got to take a look at what different kind of pulleys we have in here so that we can take off the serpentine belt from this entire assembly. So if we're working from left to right, we're gonna find the coolant pump wheel right here with the coolant pump found on the back of it. We've got our friction wheel, we have our crank pulley or a harmonic balancer. We have our tensioner found right here. This is the pulley for the alternator. And last but not least, this is the pulley for the AC condenser. So if you take note of the entire arrangement, you'll actually see that the serpentine belt is not actually connected to the coolant pump by any means. The only thing that makes it so that this spins is the friction wheel right here. So when the crank pulley is turning and the friction wheel is not engaged, the coolant pump will not be spinning. However, when it does engage and when it does pull inwards, it puts pressure on the crank, spins this pulley right here, and then in turn it spins the coolant pulley. So to take all of this out, we first have to relieve the pressure from the tensioner right here by lifting up and spinning this little nut right here. If you have a Mini Cooper, and you wanna do this procedure, you're in luck because you can do this while this is in the car very easily. Now, with this motor in the car, there's going to be no access to anything in here. And that's why they've designed this tool right here. This is for the R56. And this guy right here is for the R53 or the R50. So the way that you use this is you just attach this to the side of the tensioner, just like that. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna push down on this and it's gonna relieve the pressure from the tensioner. Now once you turn that and you relieve the pressure from the belt, you wanna push this little pin right here in so it holds the tensioner up, like that, and then relieve the pressure from here and then you can take this off. And then when you do that, there's no more slack on your serpentine belt. So that did make this a little bit looser, but you can see the friction wheel is still coming in contact with the crank pulley and we won't be able to slide this off. And that's why we first have to pull on this little tab right here and this puts the friction wheel into service mode. Have it out like that and then you're gonna pull on it more and it's gonna release the pressure on here. Ready, watch, just like that. So you can see this can move and then we can slide the serpentine belt off of all three of these pulleys and then that is removed. Now if you want to replace the serpentine belt, you just put your new one back on there, hold this so the tensioner is not putting any pressure on here, and then as soon as you're done, just push the little button thing back in so it's flush. So when now at this point, we can disconnect each one of these bolts that are holding each one of these pulleys in place. So we're gonna first begin by working on the front side of the motor and we're gonna work our way backwards. We're going to begin by removing the two bolts that are securing the tensioner and the top of the alternator up to the block. Once you take them out, you can wiggle the tensioner out of the way and then set it aside. After that, there's going to be one more bolt found on the bottom side of the alternator that's holding it up to the block, and then once you take that out, you'll be able to then wiggle out the alternator as well. Now, depending on how old your car is, it might be a little bit trickier to take this thing out, but you should be able to wiggle it since there's a guide pin found on the back side of the alternator that's holding it and lining it up. If we move down a little more, we'll be able to see that we have the AC compressor found on the front of the motor. Now, if you remove the one bolt found on the bottom of it and the two found on the top, we'll be able to remove the AC compressor from the AC compressor bracket. So again, there's guide pins and it might be a little stuck. If you need to, give these things a little tap with a hammer to make them slide out. Now, once you have that out, there's going to be that bracket that's securing it up to the block. There's going to be two 13 millimeter bolts and one 13 millimeter nut and stud found on the back of it. Once you zip those things out, you might also need to use a hammer to tap them and break them free. Since my car was winter driven, there is a little bit of corrosion and oxidation found on the aluminum, so you can get it out, but it might need a little love tap or two. We're gonna move to the top of the motor now. Now there's gonna be two bolts that are securing the top part of the motor mount up to the side of the motor. Those are gonna be zipped in pretty tight. There's gonna be two found on the center of the mount and then two additional ones found on the side. Now all four of them need to be removed so that we can get access to the bolts that are securing the lower part of the mount up to the cylinder head. 
With that removed, you can see there's four additional Torx bolts that are securing the smaller motor mount up to the cylinder head. Next up, we're going to be removing the friction wheel from the side of the motor. So you can see there's three rusty bolts. You can take them out, zip them off, and the whole thing should come out rather nicely. Following that, we're going to be removing the water pump wheel, and you can see that there's three bolts securing it up to the water pump. Take them out, and then you can wiggle off the wheel from the pump itself. It's going to be two different pieces, and you can see mine's a little rusty, so it might be a little bit tricky to take off. Now, I never went ahead and removed the water pipe that's found on the back side of the motor. So as soon as you take this out, there is probably going to be a little bit of coolant. So if you're going to pull it out, be ready to catch any fluid that's going to come out of it. With the water pipe removed, that should remove most of the coolant that's found on the water pump. Now there's going to be five bolts that are securing the water pump up to the block. So you have to remove each one of them. Again, set them aside. Pretty straightforward stuff. If we move down the side of the motor, we're going to see that there is another mount that's secured up to the block. So this one here is to prevent the motor from rocking forwards and backwards under load. Once you remove these four bolts, the entire thing can be removed. Now this thing is made out of steel, so just whenever you're ready to take out the last bolt, be ready to catch it. One more thing we need to remove is the EVAP canister. So it's small, there's nothing really big, and it's not really that bulky, so just take it out, three bolts, pretty easy. With the EVAP canister removed, there's going to be another bolt and stud that's securing a little bracket up to it. Take it out and set that aside because that guy right there is for the intake. It's to support the weight of it as soon as everything is bolted up together. Now to the left of it, there's also going to be a little knock sensor that we need to take out. Once we remove that, a tiny bit of oil will come out of this hole, so just get ready to catch anything. Moving to the front side of the motor with all the accessory stuff, there's going to be a little bracket and that guy right there is to hold the AC line once the engine is in the engine bay. On the bottom side of the motor, there's going to be the oil pan. Now to remove that, there's going to be many little bolts that are secured around the perimeter of the oil pan. There still should be a tiny bit of oil that's found in the oil pan, so just when you're taking it off and pulling it down, be careful not to spill it. The oil pan is secured up to the block with a little bit of gasket maker. So as soon as you have the oil pan removed, you can grab a razor and just scrape off most of that little gasket that's still left on the block. With the engine in this state, with most of the parts disconnected from it, along with the oil pan, we can actually look into the oil pan and it might give us an idea as to what could have gone wrong. So typically if something went wrong in the engine, you might find remains of parts in the pan itself. So there is a little bit of oil that's in there, but from the looks of it, there are no actual clumps of anything found inside of there. So you can see that right there is the drain bolt but from the looks of it, there's nothing else there. I'm gonna put the camera on a tripod and actually fish through this stuff to see if there's anything that, that would actually tell me if there's anything broken um, just from looking at it from here. Okay, good news. I don't think there's anything in there that is a distinctive giveaway as to a problem because right now there's just oil inside of here. Okay, so that is very good news. Um, these motors, when the timing chains go and when other parts go, it's very common to see parts of the timing chain along with the timing chain guides found inside the oil pan. So seeing that there's nothing is very good. So that probably just fell out when I was removing the oil pan. But this is a little bit of RTV gasket um, that's hardened. But okay, that's good. So see that? Just oil. So that's good news. I'm going to put this back onto the bottom of the block. Um, and then we're going to start working from the top of the engine and work our way down. Working on the cylinder head, we can start by removing a 8mm bolt that's securing a bracket for the oil dipstick. Once you take that little bolt out, the bracket and the dipstick should be able to be removed and extracted from the cylinder head and into the block. We removed the valve cover in one of the earlier videos and we put it back on so it wouldn't get dusty or anything else for that matter. But in this video we can take it off. So we reinstalled two bolts and we have to take both of them out from the valve cover so we can see everything found underneath it. Working on the transmission side of the engine, you're going to see that there's going to be a vacuum pump. And this guy right here is held in place by two bolts. Now the vacuum pump is what creates vacuum for the brake booster and other components in the engine. The vacuum that's created for the motor is not made from the intake. It's made from this device right here. It is indeed camshaft driven, so as soon as you take out those bolts, you have to slide it off of the camshaft. Now it might be a little stuck, but once you take out those two bolts, it should come out. Be sure to just remove it straight out so you don't damage anything. There's also going to be an o-ring that needs to come off with it so just be sure to keep both of those together. 
Now on the opposite side of the cylinder head, there's going to be another camshaft driven component, and this is the high pressure fuel pump. Once you take out the bolts that are leading to it, you should be able to just set it aside as there's no other O-rings that are sealing it up. So next up we need to set the timing and hold and lock the camshafts in place so that we can disconnect on this side the Vanos and the exhaust sprocket from the camshaft. So the reason why we're going to be locking these in place is so that as soon as we disconnect these things, the camshaft lobes, some of them might be under pressure from the springs that are in there. And if they are, as soon as we disconnect this side here, as soon as we disconnect this cam from the camshaft, uh, it could spin on us and could just potentially do some damage. So we're gonna be locking both of these in place. Now the way that we're doing it is using this little square end of the camshaft. You can see that these are both aligned and in the exact same spots. Now I'm gonna be using a special tool, looks like this, and the way that it works is it slides over top of each one of those little squares. It slides over top of them. And then with it like that, we're going to be putting a bolt through here and into the head. So it's going to be securing them and it's going to hold them and prevent them from spinning on us from either left or right. This tool that I have that locks both camshafts in place is actually two separate pieces that are bolted together. You can see that there's a nut in between both of them that are securing both single pieces together. Once you have both of them lined up on the cams, you should then use the hardware that comes included with the tool and you're going to be holding and screwing this piece down onto the cylinder head. Now you want to make sure that the camshaft is in the proper orientation. To do exactly that, you want to be sure that you can see the word IN on the intake camshaft and X on the exhaust camshaft. That's going to indicate that the camshafts and the crankshaft are in the proper orientation. It's not going to be that much of an issue for us now since we're taking everything off, but if you were just locking the timing chain and everything in place and you were just replacing the chain, the tensioners and all that stuff, it is crucial to have it so that everything stays in its spot. Now on the back side of the motor towards the timing chain, there's going to be a tensioner that you're going to need to remove. Now that's going to be holding up the top part of the left tensioner and that part swivels in and out. So once you remove the tensioner, you'll be able to remove the slack from the timing chain. Once that's done, you can then remove the exhaust sprocket that's found on the actual timing chain. You're going to be able to disconnect that, remove it, and put that bolt aside. Now that bolt you're not going to be reusing because that's a torque to yield bolt, so it will stretch. So when you want to put this all back together, you'll have to replace it with a new bolt. Moving down towards the crankshaft, we're going to want to remove the harmonic balancer. And it's held in place by three Torx bolts. Take them out, set them aside, and then the pulley itself should be able to be removed from the crankshaft. After that, there's going to be another intermediary piece in between the crankshaft and the pulley. Now, it's going to be in place with an 18 millimeter bolt. Take it off, zip it off, and then set it aside. Now that that is removed, we can move up a little bit, and we can see that there's two bolts, one found here and one found there. And those right there, they secure in the timing chain guides that are found on the tensioner side and the slack side. So the timing chain on this side here moves in and out, where the one on this side stays stationary. So we've got one bolt there and one bolt there. And if we move a little bit up, we can see that we have this extra one there. And because this side is stationary, it's held in place by two bolts, one there and one there. And then this side, it's stationary down here in the bottom and it pivots on the top. So it swings in and out. What we're gonna need to do is remove each one of these using a Torx 45 extractor. So with the T45 socket, you can use it on the end of your ratchet, and then you're just going to be taking out each one of these three bolts. So the bottom two have little O-rings found on the base of them to prevent any oil from coming out of them, and the top one, for some reason, doesn't have that. It doesn't really make sense to me, but for whatever reason, the top one doesn't have an O-ring. So just take note of that orientation when you guys have to put all this stuff back together. Following that comes removing the timing chain guide found on the top of the cylinder head. It's going to be held in place by two 8mm bolts. Following that comes removing the Vano sprocket, which is a part of the intake. Now this is for the variable intake adjustments for the valves. You're going to be removing it from the side by using an external torque socket to extract it. Now again, this is also a torque to yield bolt, so you will not be using this again. So with that all done now, we can lift up on the chain, and it should remove the entire timing chain, both valve guides, the one that's stationary along with the adjustable one, along with the crankshaft sprocket. So all of that should come out in one shot. 
So we are making progress. Now at this point, we can pretty much take off the entire cylinder head from the block, but in order to do that, we have to take out the cylinder head bolts. So there's going to be a couple of them that are found on the inside of here. So if you come from up top, you can see that there's one bolt in between each pair of springs. And if you go around the entire thing, you can see that there's many. And on the entire surface, like up in here, in the main part of the cylinder head, they're all going to be E12 bolts. If you come to the side, we've got an extra E10 there, an E10 there, and another additional E10 Torx bolt right there. But as soon as you take all of those out, we should be able to lift this up. To remove the cylinder head, we're going to need to remove those three E10 bolts first. Now once those are removed and extracted, we then remove the larger E12 bolts found holding the cylinder head onto the block. To remove them, the owner's manual and BMW, they both recommend that you start removing the bolts from the center of the cylinder head and then work your way outwards. Now it's kind of weird how they tell you to do that because the bolts in the middle are the first ones to be torqued up. So you'd think they'd be the last ones to be removed, but that's not the case. But I'm going to be doing it how the book and the dealer tell me to do it. So this is how it's going to be done. To remove the two last bolts that are holding the cylinder head down, they're blocked off by the little camshaft holding tool. So once you take that off, the cams might spin because they still are under pressure, but with that tool removed and the chain disconnected, nothing is going to get damaged. So here comes the moment of truth. With all the bolts disconnected, we should just be able to lift this up and out. Just like that. With the head set aside, there is still one more thing that's found in between the cylinder head and the block, and that is the head gasket. So if your head gasket is gone, it's going to be this little piece right here that I'm going to be lifting up. That means that there's going to be some sort of way that the coolant is going to get into the cylinders, or the cylinder combustion, all that compression and everything can get into your coolant. So one way or another, you have a leak in here. So if you ever have to replace a cylinder head gasket, that is what is going to be replaced. So we have our cylinder head removed from the block. And looking in here, nothing really seems to be, you know, out of the ordinary. There is a little bit of carbon buildup, but that's pretty standard with a car that's got this many kilometers on it. But like, there's nothing damaged physically um, inside of here. The mating surface all looks fine. I took the head gasket off, everything looked okay. The pistons look good. The sidewalls look good. They all seem to be perfectly fine. I'll even zoom in a little bit more to make your life a little bit easier and see if, uh, you know, let me know, let me know if you guys see anything. Like, obviously there's a little bit of carbon buildup found on the piston, but I mean, there's nothing that would really strike me saying, hey, there's a problem right here. Moving over to the cylinder head, we have cylinder one, two, three, and four. So this side here is where it mounts up to the transmission, and this is the front side of the motor. So if we're looking at the motor, this right here, this cylinder is the problem that we had. So this had a misfire in cylinder four. So if we come and look at the bottom side of the cylinder head, we should be able to distinguish something. And I actually did find a little problem. So the way that this works is that you're gonna have each one of your intake and exhaust valves found in here in the cylinder head. Now each one of these valves has to make a proper seal up against the cylinder head so that you not only get good combustion, you get good pressure, but the engine runs smoothly. Because if you have a little leak in here and the engine wants to try to combust and make power, if you have a little leak, some of that power is going to escape. When that air and pressure escapes out of a little hole, that's not gonna be translated into power towards the crank. So you're gonna have a loss of power. So taking a closer look at the cylinder head, this is cylinder one, two, three, and four. So if you look at each one of these valves, we have the exhaust and the intake valves found on here. So we're gonna make sure that it has a proper seal up to the cylinder head. So cylinder one was good. There's cylinder two, there's number three, and there's number four. Now one thing that I noted was that this valve right here doesn't seem like it has a proper seat up against the cylinder head. Because if you compare it to the other ones, it looks like it's sticking up. Actually, same with this one a little bit. But we're going to get into that in a bit. So that right there is the reason why my engine is misfiring. Now, because of this process, because of this extensive procedure, I am going to be going ahead and also rebuilding all of the stuff with better parts. So that not only am I going to be fixing the problem, but I'm going to be making this cylinder head bigger and better so they can handle and produce more power. So this here is Mechanic Milan's diagnosis to the mini motor. 
So what I'm guessing happened is this. So since my engine is a direct injection engine, that means that there's no gasoline or solvents that are hitting the backside of the intake valves. Now because of that, there's going to be gasoline and carbon and oil and all that stuff that's going to deposit on the backside of the valves. Now over time, that oil is gonna dry out and it's gonna turn into carbon or gunk or goop or just some thick crap that you don't want on your engine. And especially not on your valves and in the actual combustion chamber. However, over time, this thing's got over 100,000 kilometers on it, over time, that's gonna build up. And if any piece of that will break off and that gets stuck in between a valve, if that gets stuck between a valve and the valve seat, it won't make a proper seal. So if you just have a little bit accumulating now and then, that won't make a difference. You're just gonna gum up the valves, but you're not gonna have a distinctive problem like that, like what I had with the mini motor. So I took a look at the intake, I took a look at the exhaust side, and before when I did walnut blast my intake valves, um, it did clean it up, but I went to inspect the cylinder head and I didn't see any walnut shells anywhere. So it's not that. So I, cause like I thought to myself, maybe it was me. Maybe I'm the reason why I killed my motor. But for whatever reason, the cylinder head is not making a proper seal in uh, cylinder four and I'm guessing cylinder two. And that's why it's been giving me the misfire. So with this route, with now this diagnosis, as nice as it is that I found the problem, it kind of sucks that I have to get all this stuff done. But here's the thing, because I'm gonna be going through all this procedure, since I've got it basically stripped off, the cylinder head is removed from the block. That means that I can now take everything else apart, everything in the cylinder head, everything in the bottom end of the motor, I can take all that apart and replace it with better stuff. So bigger valves, better springs, titanium retainers, valves, all that stuff. Everything is going to be upgraded and beefed up because if I can do that now, I won't ever have to do that later because if I can take apart the motor right now, put it all back together and have it perfectly running and bulletproof, that's what I'm gonna be going for. That's gonna be awesome because if I really ideally don't wanna take this all apart again just to have this exact same thing happen. So I'm not gonna be replacing this with stock parts. I'm not just gonna be doing hey, let's take this stuff off, put it back together, clean it up, and that's it. I'm gonna be making it bigger, bulletproof, better, and more awesome. So with that being said, like there's not really much more I'm gonna be doing today in this video. If you guys wanna stay tuned and you wanna see the rest of the series, click the subscribe button. You guys are gonna see everything that's gonna be happening with this. So the engine, the, the cylinder head, the motor, everything needs to be taken apart. I've gotta bring all this stuff down to a machine shop, have them properly sort this entire motor out, um, new pistons, valves, forged components, better internals, everything is gonna be beefed up, as I said. Um, but if you guys wanna stay tuned, click the subscribe button and you guys are gonna see everything that I'm doing. This is gonna be my first time taking apart a motor and building it up with much better, stronger internals. And if you wanna learn a thing or two, learn from it. Share it with your buddies. Maybe you got somebody that's got a broken motor. You should tell them to put some forged internals in there too. If you guys have any questions for the video, put them down in the comment section below. I'll be looking through everything and commenting on whatever I can. But otherwise, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking through all the way to this point. Thank you for being a subscriber. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.